Welcome to the March to a Million podcast with Greg DuPont, founder of the Wealth Solutions Network. In this podcast, Greg shares his journey to positively impact one million lives by creating an army of financially minded attorneys who embrace an expanded role in their clients' lives. Greg and his guests challenge the status quo in the legal profession and the financial services industry and show attorneys how they can improve their lives, provide greater value to their clients, and experience greater professional satisfaction. Join us in this movement and strengthen your business by learning how to solve your clients' most pressing financial problems. Hello and welcome to another March to a Million podcast with your host, Greg DuPont. Now, our last podcast really set a very strong foundation of some philosophy that we think is very important for all WSN members to truly embrace and understand before you get moving with joining and actually becoming a WSN member. Today, Greg is going to take it to the next level. In fact, <laughs> the email he sent to me this morning, it said, yesterday, we got off into the wilderness of my epiphany slash vision. Today, we get down to business. Mr. DuPont, let's get ready down. Let's get down to business, my friend. Where are we starting? Stock market's a Ponzi scheme. <laughs> think, I can get, think I can get that through compliance? <laughs> Maybe. Probably yeah. not, but elaborate. Yeah, well, oh, we'll go deep. Uh, yeah, but but I, I went to I went to the the source of all knowledge known to man, Wikipedia, right? Oh yeah, great. Uh, yeah, and and I looked up Ponzi scheme because this float was floating around my area, and, and here's what Wikipedia again, collective knowledge, right? Uh, a Ponzi scheme is a form of fraud that lures investors and pays profits to earlier investors with funds from more recent investors. This type of scheme misleads investors by either by either falsely suggesting that profits are derived from legitimate business activities or by exaggerating the extent and profitability of legitimate business activities, leveraging new investments to fabricate or supplement these profits. Ugh. With little or no legitimate earnings, Ponzi schemes require a constant flow of new money to survive. When it becomes hard to recruit new investors, or when large numbers of existing investors cash out, these schemes collapse. Now, Matt, I, I've read that, and I'm, I'm sure I can come up with some technical dif differences between what we're experiencing now in the market. But you know, the, what, you know what the primary difference is between a Ponzi scheme and our current market? Hmm. A, a Ponzi scheme is illegal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In, in our market, the way it currently is, and it just you know, the the analogy here, yeah, I think it's very apt mm -hmm. as we as we look at all the money that's been thrown in mm -hmm. by the Fed to prop up the valuations of the market, or, you know, directly and indirectly. Right? There's been no other place for the money to go. And I, I'm not, and I'm not really there yet. That I'm going to say that uh, Ken Fisher is Bernie Madoff, or Ken Fisher's ilk, I should say, right? More aptly. Yeah. But the way that the system has been set up to provide financial guidance to the consumer is aiding and abetting this Ponzi scheme. And, and this is where uh, I'm hellbent on getting attorneys to understand this stuff so that they can break this cycle. Because the way that the market is set up, specifically the market for financial guidance is set up, it all promotes institutional inertia. Mm -hmm. It all promotes keeping the client under control and it all promotes the best interest of the industry, not the consumer. Does that, does that serve them, Matt? It, it does not. It, it, yeah. There, there's a couple of things I want you to elaborate on. Um, um, first off, if you could give us an example of a company that is really textbook definition of the Ponzi scheme that you had talked about previously, I don't know how specific you want to get there, Greg. Uh, so there's number one. And then number two, um, 
We're about to have the largest great wealth transfer in the history of man, which means that that money is going to be taken out of the stock market. We know this, right? We know that if you inherit money, whether it's an IRA, whether it's life insurance or whatever, the 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 beneficiary of that spends that whatever it is, 80% of the time within the first three years of getting that money. There, there's going to be all of these withdrawals taken out of the stock market. Is it going to be able to sustain itself when $74 trillion is going to be taken out of the market? And that's just in the next 15 years. So first, uh, examples of real, I'll call it Ponzi scheme, but not in, in the true sense of the word, but it it, it was. And that's, that's where my first exposure uh, in in large scale was to financial fraud. That was when I was brought in as a financial advisor uh, to take over a registered investment advisory firm that was put into receivership by the SEC. Mm-hmm. And in that office, we found that the prior advisor had in fact engaged in a Ponzi type scheme and took s- several million dollars from the investors. Oh. Yeah. Uh, and all kinds of reasons why that went went a, you know, astray, and he did do a hard time. But this stuff happens. You know, it's not just the Bernie Madoffs of the world. It's it's the, it's the small fry. This is a small shop, and, and so these things do happen. But but if we look at an institutional scale, okay, it's it, when I'm using that phrase impolitely. <laughs> um, but if we look at how people get their advice right now. Okay, on writ large. So there are there are pockets, obviously. They're good, they're good advisors out there. I don't want to say there aren't any. Mm-hmm. I know some of them. I know some pretty bad ones too, but that's another story. <laughs> uh, but when you look at where your where your clients are predominantly getting their guys guidance from, they're getting it from their 401k providers. Mm-hmm. They think that's their financial advisor. But that 401k provider that they're talking to, that guy is an employee of the company. The, of the financial industrial complex. And so his job is to keep you invested in their 401k. He is incentivized to increase your balances in their coffers. He is by definition disincentivized to give you any guidance to get you out of their coffers. And as you know, Matt, you've you've been an observer to this industry for years now, and you've seen the consolidation and commoditization of investment advice. Uh, you've seen uh, where you know people are what half million dollars and and up still are are being sent to call centers and and not getting personal guidance in these places. You know, so. That has. I, I, I need to define something very quickly because yeah. you, uh, when you have a four hundred one k provider, they are called a TPA, a third party administrator. They're not even called an advisor, dude. All they are is an administrator on your four hundred one k by definition, and the licenses that are needed to manage that. So, I just wanted your audience to know that the TPA does not stand for advice. It is actually just administration of the four hundred one k. Yeah, and then they will have some registered reps that will come through and and talk to uh, the people there, uh, incentivizing them to keep it in the house, or to bring more in house, which is the biggest mistake that a lot of people make. Uh, and 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 they make this they make these mistakes based upon uh, arguments about cost. Mm-hmm. And you know, Matt, I, you and I have kind of joked around about the cost of of advice, uh, and this is another example where. Uh, the system is broken and, and works against the consumer, uh, and that is under with the AUM model, the assets under management, uh, where um, you know you're paying a 1.5 two percent fee uh, to get advice and guidance and investment expertise. Uh, and and Matt, you're you're pretty good at math, right? So if I've got a million dollars with you and I'm paying you 2% a year, how much am I paying you each year? 20 grand. Yeah. And if I've got you as my client here for 10 years, how much am I paying you? $200,000. Yeah. That's a, that's a hell of a lot of cheddar, isn't it? That's a lot of cheddar. 
Uh, and the consumers are waking up to that. You know, I, I've got AO, AUM clients on my book, and because mm-hmm. because it's a part of the of the of this ecosystem, uh, and, and I hate it, but it's it's business. Mm-hmm. The, here here's the problem with it, not just the fee problem. It's the system keeps trying to find a way to justify that twenty thousand dollars a year, uh, and and that means they've been you know luxury skyboxes and bullshit like that. You know, I take my clients to a to a nice dinner and justify them that twenty thousand um, dollars. Most of them would rather have less money being spent on me. Um, and when you're in a a big shop like a uh, oh, I've I've got the big envelope lately. Have you got the big envelope lately from Mister Fisher? Uh, he's not a going after me, dude. Uh, uh, but I've seen the big envelope, my friend. I've seen it. Yeah, and and so once it gets into that ecosystem, into the advisory ecosystem, then it's there's that institutional inertia. And when we're talking about a publicly traded advisory system, maybe even you can go there with private equity as well, because profit is is what they're looking for, and so they're forced to get more um, efficient, shall we say with their investment system, not necessarily passing it through the client, but rather passing it through to the ownership. And so they're getting less and less investment guidance, more and more cookie gutter portfolios uh, that don't help them. And it, it keeps them from having a, a exposure to other ideas. And this is where the attorneys in WSN need to come to the front door and say, listen, when was the last time that you had an independent review of this stuff? Mm -hmm. Somebody that's only looking out right now at your best interest. Because when we do that, we see the examples that we talk about in this podcast regularly of of people that they can make some decisions that improve their lives by changing the way they are saving their money and diversifying themselves outside of the Ponzi scheme. Yeah. A couple of things <clears throat> that I want you to, to, to pull apart a little bit more. So that one and a half to 2%, uh, which means that you have to eke out more than 2% annually in order to just be at, at zero, right? What a lot of uh, people don't understand, and actually I don't think a lot of WSN members understand is then there are fees on top of that, right? And so if you're using a TAMP or if you're using a third-party money manager or if you are are actually still using American fund, A shares, whatever, right? There's fees, fees and fees and fees and fees and fees that are buried in there. And sometimes, and I've actually had an old client of mine here who deconstructed a mutual fund specifically. And after all was said and done, Greg, you had to make 4%. 4% 4% to just be in the in in the in the black you were in the red 4% every year by just using and it was a very very popular mutual fund right and so let t- talk a little bit about your your experience with with that too uh and, and how you provide education to help solve that problem for WSN members so i um when i took my first bite at this apple and joined a national financial planning and mutual fund firm. Uh, that's when I found out that math that you just talked about, because uh, they uh, they had a leading family of uh, mutual funds, right? Uh, which means that you get if you put all your money in the mutual funds, you get a little bit of a cut in the on the cost and you know, buy all that stuff, uh, which basically meant that you got some crap and funds and some good funds. Right. And you paid just a little bit less than confiscatory rates. And so they said, well, let's let's put this in a wrap program. So now they get to charge confiscatory rates and and you get to go out there and say, yeah, we're trying to deliver value. Four percent. OK, well, that, that math on a million dollars at two percent was bad enough. Right. Uh, but um, that's where my movement went towards. uh First, the uh, move to the escape to being independent uh, and the world of exchange rate funds and those type of things. And I learned some lessons there as well. 
uh, you know, that the primary lesson was uh, I didn't have enough time or enough um, insight uh, to to be an effective money manager. Uh, I had to fire myself for that because I was just not delivering value. Uh, and so that's why I had to go to the world of third-party money managers and being a manager of managers, that type of stuff for people at WSN and my clients. And thankfully, you know, we see that the cost structures on those are coming down uh, as we as competitions there and more and more uh, that commoditization uh, that's affecting all of this industry is affecting that element as well. So the the key there is that you, know, you always got to be nimble. You've, you've got to be looking forward, trying to change. I've changed many times uh, and that doesn't happen in the mass market investment world. You know, you, how, how long does it take to have Fidelity make a change on their platform? You know, uh, no idea, right? But I, I'm sure in a bureaucratic mess like that, um, let alone when you're talking about these, uh, uh, the name escapes me, Matt. You might know the name off the off the top of your mind. Um, you know, they're they're basically sale marketing arrangement contracts between mutual fund promoters and that and and the people that get them on their shelf. They actually go by many names, <laughs> which is spooky and kind of a little bit yucky. Uh, but yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I you you've got all of the 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 executive vice president you've got all of the wholesalers you've got i mean they're basically middlemen right who are just you know scraping money off of the top that it doesn't end up benefiting the 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 client on the back end it, was that part of the ponzi scheme definition was there like a middle person involved uh in in that because they don't really here's the deal I'm sorry, I have to have you expand on a couple of things here. So the first one is they're not adding any value, right? So if you're looking at the 4% or if you're looking at the 2%, which by the way, all in is the, the average of what most consumers are paying for financial advice. And that includes a financial planning fee, investments under management fee, and all of that sort of stuff. So that's pretty standard within the industry. If you have a million dollars and you're spending $20,000 a year and you're meeting with that advisor twice a year, are they worth ten thousand dollars an hour? I, th you know, one of the things that you had written me in our communication this morning is the math. I want to do math here. Like, let, let's let's prove this out in the numbers. And, and I'm going to go a little off script here, if you don't mind, for a moment. But one of the things that really frustrates me about this fiduciary movement that has been happening in financial services is they said that any commissionable product was a non, what didn't have the client's best interest. So, so $200,000 for 10 years of advice is in the customer's best interest? That's just hard for me to swallow. Well, and when you think about the, the commission taint that is painted on a mm -hmm. uh, insurance product, and that's, that's a taint that really has its um, genesis in, in the mutual fund world, yeah. where you paid a... 6% load or Lord knows higher back in the days to, to get into a fund. And that came off your principal off the top. When, when you're doing the same thing in an insurance based uh, product, you put a hundred thousand dollars in, you're getting a hundred thousand dollars in the, the commission is being paid by the insurance company and they're taking the risk on that. And so that. That's been an interesting um, evolution uh, in the market from the the stasis that's that's created by paying a load. It, you know, okay, I got to make sure that I've got my recoup my investment uh, to the new stasis that's included by by uh, by sticking with my guy at one percent a year. The, the industry, the financial industrial complex, is brilliant that way. They went from getting a 5%, 6% load up front to getting 1% a year or, or in perpetuity, yeah. turning each and every 401k owner into their own little annuity. Yeah. And then they control the messaging so that they don't do anything. They leave themselves in a spot where they are 
absolutely bare ass naked when the when the tide goes out and the Ponzi scheme gets called. Yeah. Now I know you're an attorney <laughs> and you're a good attorney. Uh, but you totally dodged one of my questions earlier. <laughs> I'm going to come back to, which is, I'm going to tee you up maybe a little bit better than I had teed you up previously. Let's talk about Tesla. Okay. So I know we're not supposed to talk about independent stocks, and this is not investment advice. I am not a licensed professional. Uh, so I want all of the compliancy people out there to hear that right out of the gate. Um, and, and But if you look at the bottom line, how Tesla makes their money, it really looks by definition very similar to what you had read at the beginning. And that's one of the top holdings in almost everybody's ETF mutual fund in portfolio. It's one of the, one of the things that um, I admire with uh, Mr. Musk. Uh, it, and it's the same game that was played Backed by Edison, you know, you, you got to have a, a, a good amount of hucksterism in you. Uh, but here's the difference, right? Uh, with the hucksterism of of Edison, the hucksterism of Musk, you know, the company really it's only the initial offerings that the company's really getting the, the juice from. Now, all the other actors afterwards, the, the churning by other people that are tweeting this, tweeting that, uh, or Xing this, Xing that, I guess. I don't know how we say that these days. But that's then that's the that's where the traders are making their money, right? And so it's uh, so the Ponzi scheme, as it were, is built upon legitimacy. Uh, and that's that that veneer of legitimacy that keeps it from being illegal. Yeah. Doesn't make it any less any doesn't make it any less devastating when the tide does go out. Well, we talked a little bit about that tide previously that uh with all of the money that has been injected into our marketplace and that bill is going to come due. Um we didn't actually talk about that great wealth transfer that I talked about a few minutes ago that there is going to be substantial withdrawals because all of the boomers are actually going to have to start taking required minimum distributions are going to be taking money out of the the stock market in order to manifest and and really live their lifestyle. Um what what do you, what do you say about that? Well, going back to that definition, right? Uh, when when the new when it becomes hard to recruit new investors, or when large numbers of investors cash out, these schemes collapse. Yeah. Now, if we know one thing, we know that the government needs increased taxes, right? That's that's a given. Yes. But even if we if we just status quo this, and we look at the the generational transfer of wealth that's been long talked about and human um behavior and or taxes so that, that's 70 trillion whatever that number is 40 percent of that is going to go out in taxes to uncle sam <laughs> what does that yeah. do to our market yeah yeah Ooh. yeah take, take a, a huge chunk of money out and unless they keep printing money to fill it back up where's the new money coming from you know we've talked about it together uh, uh the, the difficulties that the younger generation have saving yeah. where are the new investors coming from yeah yeah and and i don't know dude this is this is why you know, i'm so passionate about this message and uh why i feel like i'm on this mission uh because we got to wake people up People need to understand these demographic and economic factors are out there. And I, I pray that I'm wrong and I'm just, you know, tilting at windmills here. Yeah. But if I'm right. Even if you're a little right, dude, that, I mean, that, that's the the scope of what I want the listeners to understand is, is, is first off, it's not a, it's not a black and white thing here. There's gradients of correctness. And, and if you're an, and I want the listeners to understand Greg DuPont's not the only person who's talking about this. There are so many people who are talking about this coming tide 
But what I think is amazing is that you've got a system in place to be able to help estate planning attorneys really provide really great advice. And let's talk about advice, right? Uh, because I, I think that there's a misnomer out there and a lot of people don't truly understand what advice should be what it can be, and what's out there. So let's start uh, with the wirehouse model. So these are the Morgan Stanleys, what we in the industry call captive financial advisors, employees of large firms. How do they work and what sort of advice are they giving? So their, their advice is predominantly on investment. Anything that they talk about uh, outside of the, the management of the portfolio itself, uh, for the most part, uh, is superficial at best, uh, because you know when we're talking about what what advice do people need to have, and that is okay. We need to have some rational basis to our risk. Where the wirehouse model is, first of all, they recruit a broker when he's young, chew through his family's assets, the broker washes out family assets get left behind and they get absorbed by the older brokers. That's, that's sounding awfully, awfully ponzi again, isn't it? <laughs> and then they make their money going on on that, right? And, and they're in perpetuity. Uh, and you get to have your name on the side of the building that way, okay? uh, let alone big buildings and arenas and things like that. Uh, so that's the way that the typical wirehouse is, is approaching this stuff. And so when you've got a client that has a quote unquote advisor that is in one of these brokerage houses, first of all, they're going to be limited uh, in providing any tax guidance. Most of them specifically disclaim the ability to provide tax guidance. So when we're talking about the four horsemen of the financial apocalypse, taxes, death, right? Market and longevity, Right, those are the four horsemen of the, of the financial apocalypse, and they can't talk about one of them, and they and let alone fix it. And so then you know you move to to a model that that I started um, with the intention of joining, which is the the fee only planning model, uh, which is which is which is a kind of a movement that started in the seventies and caught some momentum, the CFP and all that stuff. But the bottom line is for most of them to survive, they got charged so much money that most consumers can't get in can get the information they need. So they're getting underserved there as well. Uh, and the fee only ones are so um, positioned in the market that they do not participate in any of the financial um, benefits, then they close off some opportunities that make sense for people. And, and then, in fact, uh, are, are part of the CFP, I'm sorry, we have to highlight that there are six pillars of the CFP. And if you're fee only, you are not addressing two or three of the pillars of the CFP, the certified financial planning designation that they get. I have to add one other very quick thing about wirehouses. They also sell proprietary products. So, so you're, you're going to these companies and the product mix that they have, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, are actually owned by the company. And so they're basically double dipping on you. And you do not have the freedom to have a product mix that is actually what's beneficial for you. It's actually what's beneficial for the company this employee is working for. Forgot that. Thanks for adding that one. That was my life at Waddell. <laughs> oh, I mean, come from my name. oh wait they're out of business now so that's okay yeah that's true that's true <laughs> yeah well there's gonna be a lot of them going out of business here i think in the very very near future all right as we wrap this up because i just want people to know that this this is going to be an ongoing conversation we we want to make sure that all of you wsm members really understand the reality of the situation and 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 i also want you all to know that it's not just that greg dupont is a is a very 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 intelligent person because he is and and he's done his his not just his research but he's leaning on everybody else's research this is being talked about at conferences Greg, I, I don't know if I think I might have shared this with you. I was just at a humongous industry conference about a month ago. And they were saying this stuff from the main stage in front of like 1,500 
top advisors. This was one of the biggest pieces of communication that they had, not just a great wealth transfer, but the fee structures, the, the actual clients are waking up and understanding how commoditized the advice is uh, that's being out there and what you need to do to be truly different. So if you are a WSN member, you need to understand you are on the cutting edge of something that is going to be an industry movement. And the sooner you get actively involved in the teachings that Greg has here, not only are you going to be more successful, but you're actually going to be providing the advice that the general public needs. I didn't mean to just wrap up the show there, dude, but uh, you got anything to add, man, on what I just said? Uh, it's a wrap, man. Yeah. It's a wrap. Well, listen, if you have not gone, go to joinwsn.com, please, uh, and make sure that you're going ahead and finding out more information. And most importantly, please share this podcast. Listen, I know you know people. And this isn't a, a who do you know sort of referral ask here. It's you know other estate planning attorneys, other professionals who really want to have a different business model and also to provide much more complete advice. WSN is that organization to help you get the education that you need so that you can do what Greg's mission is, which is to save families from billions of dollars of loss. All right, Greg. Thanks for your brain today, brother. And thanks for letting me uh, add a little bit of color here and there. I always appreciate you giving me the opportunity to do that. Thanks for guiding me, Matt. All right, everybody. We'll see you on the other side of the mic for another episode very soon. Thank you for listening to the March to a Million podcast. Click the follow button to be notified when new episodes become available and get in touch with our team by visiting our website at www.wealthsolutionsgroup.biz or give us a call at 614-432-8065. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Wealth Solutions Network. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice from qualified financial service providers with any questions you may have.